about to embark on a thrilling journey. Today, as we delve into the world of sustainable digital innovation, I know you might be thinking, is this just a buzzword? Well, today we are here to explore the idea that it's not just a trendy phrase, it's the oxygen that sustains and propels businesses towards success. So, fasten your seatbelts, take your notebooks, because you're about to embark on an adventure where technology meets strategy and innovation becomes the heartbeat of success. Now, to guide you through this exciting expedition, we have lined up a well-known expert on all digital. Moses Kimirambo is the founder, CEO of Dot Survey, Kenya's first digital business, which conceptualizes, develops, delivers, and manages high business performance results via digital channels. Dot Survey has been operational for more than 20 years and spearheading next practices aboard Spectrum on digital marketing offerings. So who is Moses Kemirambo? He was the previously a regional manager of Opera Ads in East Africa. He was the commercial manager for East Africa, uh, known as uh, Dazan. He was the sales director of Inmobi of Africa, where he was leading uh, sales in Kenya, Egypt, Nigeria, and Ghana. He was also the founding regional manager at Delfish East Africa, formerly known as OLX, or now as we know it, GG Kenya. Moses is an, a multiple award technology, media, digital marketing, blogger, all industry analyst at MosesComirambo.com, where he runs and raves about all things digital in Kenya and in Africa. He's one of the most known regional leading uh, digital platform trainers, as well as a regular speaker and an industry panelist, and also contributes in uh, contributors along leading media. So sit back, relax, get ready to unlock the power of sustainable digital innovation. So welcome, Moses. Yeah, welcome, and thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today during uh, your one o'clock uh, lunch break. I'm so delighted to be here and to share uh, insights and thoughts around uh, all things digital innovation and also transformation as it were. A little bit about myself, I'm the founder and CEO of Dotsavi, uh, one of the first digital business agencies in the country. And today we are now celebrating over 21 years in the business. I've also worked with Opera Ads, uh, the zone goal.com. Um, for many of the men who I'm sure on this call, uh, you've probably been to this website in Mobi, uh, Dealfish. I also blog at MosesKemibar.com. I've been training people on digital marketing since 2005. And I'm also a very proud supporter of the best football club in the world, also known as Arsenal Football Club, who we know in 2024 will be winning and holding up the, the Premier League Cup. So let's wait for that moment for my team. Um, from this webinar, I hope that there are several things that you're going to achieve or see uh, that add value to what it is that you do. Number one, uh, hopefully you'll understand the digital landscape a bit better, how it's relevant to your business, how you can create a digital transformation strategy that allows you to manage all your activities, uh, get uh, insights on how to develop content, publish and reach and convert target audiences through digital channels. Channels, and most importantly, measurement, what you like to call m &E, measurement and evaluation of whether you're able to achieve the desired results from your digital activities. Um, in order to get us going, I want us to go through several things, which is, first of all, understanding the landscape as it were, locally and globally, how to develop your strategy, how to develop content that actually resonates with digital audiences, uh, social media, advertising, and possibly the hottest thing that's happening at the moment, which is AI, uh, where we can look at how businesses can leverage uh, the growing trend to do things through artificial intelligence. This is a quote from none other than Nagib Sawiri, a very successful businessman from Egypt, who at one point owned a company called Oraskom, one of the largest telecom companies in the world. And he was responsible at the time for making this quote, which was globalization is not a one-way street. And I love this quote because it provides a foundation for us to realize that through digital, we don't have to think of ourselves as being a Kenyan or East African business. We can be a global business, and meaning that we can be the ones engaging and reaching stakeholders globally through our various value propositions. So I think this is a call to action to see that, you know, it's not just about pushing, uh, receiving things that are global, but allowing ourselves to become global as businesses and as entities. For me, probably the word that has become most uh, interesting in the last three to four years is this phrase, digital transformation. And for me, the most important takeaway from this is that as much as we're adopting digital channels and activities, transformation isn't changing what we do, but rather how we do what we do. And many of the things that I'm going to share with you are really about the current practices 
and the next practices that are going to allow us to be more successful and more um, uh, impactful as organizations uh, through our businesses. When you look at the, the digital landscape today, the biggest thing that we can see is that the COVID pandemic changed everything. In fact, we often refer to it as the COVID accelerated digital transformation, where many businesses and consumers changed how they do things because of COVID. We started working from home. We started uh, using things like social media in different ways. Uh, E-commerce became a way of life even here in Kenya. And we can see that through a digital transformation strategy, we can adopt some of these technologies and platforms to make our businesses successful. When we look at the global trends, you can see over here that over 5 billion people globally are now connected through mobile devices, equally so also on social media. And this tells us that there's great opportunity around using mobile and specifically uh, social media platforms to engage our stakeholders. We can also see on this slide that Facebook, as much as many people say it's for old people, remains the largest social media, uh, followed by the likes of YouTube. Again, surprising given that it's primarily a video platform. Uh, WhatsApp, Instagram, WeChat, and yes, even TikTok, proving that it's one of the biggest platforms today. We can also see here that there's an interesting uh, perspective around how many people are connected in the country. Uh, according to this research, um, they're saying 11, almost 12 million people online. Uh, I dispute that number. I think there are many more people on social media in this country, and even more so when it comes to internet users who may not be on social media, uh, I think that number is actually understated. When it comes to what we are doing on our internet phones, you can see that we're spending close to four hours a day in Kenya actually using our devices. And again, of that time, you can see that 95.9% .9 of internet usage in the country comes through mobile devices. So whatever you're thinking of doing and engaging when it comes to your stakeholders, bear in mind that a disproportionate amount of our daytime is used on the mobile device and specifically uh, accessing things that are on the internet. We can also see from this page, again, there's a very interesting trend, again, specific to Kenya. 96.0% um, of people using uh, the internet on their phones are watching video content. And you can see the different types of content that they're consuming. Uh, again, this suggests that if you're going to have a digital strategy or transformation, video needs to be very much a part of it because we can see that that is what consumers are consuming the most. Over here, we can see how audio content is also becoming a big thing, especially when it comes to digital consumption. Um, listening to music streaming services, 36%, radio stations and so forth, 35%. Podcasts are now at at least 12% and audiobooks at 15%. Again, if you're going to build a digital innovation or transformation strategy, you need to also be thinking about the fact that consumers are listening to a lot of things online. We can see here the most used social media platforms uh, when it comes to uh, how people are using these in Kenya. Uh, WhatsApp, again, looking like the most popular followed by Facebook, Instagram, and probably quite surprisingly, TikTok in number four, even ahead of Twitter and LinkedIn. For me, this is profound because it's telling us that uh, as much as some of us might think that TikTok is just for young people, this suggests to me that many people who are older are also using TikTok to the extent that it has more users than even uh, Twitter and also LinkedIn. As we continue, uh, we can see the most favorite social media platforms. WhatsApp by a big margin is where we spend most of our time in Kenya followed by Facebook and Instagram, and again, surprisingly, TikTok being number four. And here's a very interesting slide that shows us that during the outage in October 2021, when WhatsApp went down, Kenya was one of only uh, three countries in Africa where the system actually collapsed, meaning that this tells us that a lot of Kenyans are actually using the internet uh, when it comes to WhatsApp in a very, very serious way. When it comes to online shopping activities, these are some of the numbers that really surprised me because we're seeing that almost 50% are purchasing products online, you know, ordering groceries, 20%. And initially, I thought that these numbers don't really make sense until the moment when I looked at some of these other numbers as well. You can see over here um, that when it comes to people ordering food online, over 3.7 million Kenyans are ordering through online platforms. And this was a growth of a period of about a year of over 129%. Incredible the total value of food being ordered in this country, almost $80 million. And when you look at these numbers, we can see that consumer behavior has changed significantly in the way that we're using the internet. And here you can see an example of when I went to a restaurant in Lavington, and when I walked in for a meeting, there was no, no bikes or anything. By the time I came out from that breakfast meeting, the whole area was completely full of these uh, motorcycles coming and picking food and dropping food, showing that again, in terms of digital transformation, um, the food industry has gone through a significant change. We can also see when it comes to consumer payments, Kenya is, after all, the home of M-Pesa. Uh, and again, here we can see that people are making an incredible number of digital payments uh, using digital channels. 
So when it comes to the new digital normal, what we know is that COVID-19 uh, COVID changed everything. Digital innovation has become a significant enabler for business optimization, meaning that we can be more efficient, more cost-effective, reach more consumers, and all the various benefits that come from that. Social distancing has changed our behavior. In fact, many of us are still working remotely or doing some kind of hybrid model. Uh, strategic partnerships are key, like you can see in the food sector, many of these restaurants are partnering with the likes of Glovo, Uber, and so forth to achieve what they do. And strategic investment in enhanced operations is also critical. We can also see that when it comes to digital versus traditional media, digital has a lot of key benefits compared to other channels. For instance, the richness of the media is very high. It's super interactive. We can be very precise with targeting, you know, with almost surgical precision to reach the right audience at the right time with the right message. Investment will contact is low. <laughs> Excuse me. And also measurability tends to be very high. But most importantly, when you're using digital versus traditional methods, the return on investment generally is very high. It's also important to understand the customer journey in terms of how they become aware of our brand or business, what makes them convert in terms of becoming a customer, and most importantly, what are the key drivers that retain them on our brand, our services and products after experiencing it for the first time. We need to understand how these customers come to us. So do they see our advertising? Perhaps they use our apps, maybe our corporate website, our email or social media. They engage with our platforms, they consume our content, and ultimately, whether it's online or offline, that leads to a transaction, which in many terms we also call a conversion. And that digital engagement is super key in terms of how you're able to engage your stakeholders, ultimately getting them to become your customers. It's also key to understand the conversion funnel, which is how, again, they become aware of us, whether it's through social media, engaging with us, converting, and ultimately building that retention over time. So again, it's very key that even as we acquire customers on digital channels, how do we ensure that we retain them for the long term? Digital privacy has also become a major issue. I'm sure over the last few months, you have seen many of you, uh, many businesses are now being fined by the Office of the Data Protection Commissioner for violating uh, privacy-related uh, uh, situations. And specifically, the Kenya Data Privacy Act that came into effect in 2019 is now fully operational. And basically, if you're going to do good digital, you need to make sure that you pay attention to the risks inherent in violating any of the data uh, privacy laws. We can see, again, when it comes to consumer sentiment or behavior around privacy, uh, that many Kenyans, up to 75% here, are saying that they are concerned about uh, what is fake or real. Uh, 35%, almost 36% are saying they're concerned about how their data is used. Uh, many are declining cookies, which is a way of tracking them online. And we can see that data privacy is a major consideration for consumers. We're also seeing there's a new dispensation coming into the space where we're talking about what we call first-party data. Many of the platforms, including Apple and Google today, are restricting how much you can use customer data on their platforms requiring organizations to invest in getting first-party data. First-party data just means I have your phone number, your email, your you know, location, and so forth, but not necessarily sitting on these platforms, but sourced with consent directly from consumers. So the three things I think that are most important when you look at the landscape, number one, content is all about digital transformation, and mobile-first content is critical. Users are mobile and social, so we need to factor that into everything that we do. And we're seeing a major transition happening where there's affordable smartphones and fast internet, not just in Kenya, but across the continent, that's driving this digital transformation across the board. When it comes to building a strategy for your digital transformation or innovation, there's several things we need to consider. We need to understand as a business organization, what are our objectives? What are we trying to achieve? Are we trying to save costs? Are we trying to increase sales? Are we trying to be more operationally efficient through automation? What are the goals for each objective? What are the key performance indicators that we're aiming for, and what are those targets there for? What are the channels we're going to focus on? Do we go on every social media? Do we go on every capability or just some of them? And most importantly, what are the critical success factors? What do our people need to know that they don't currently know? What skills do they need? And what platforms do we need to implement to achieve these? And most importantly, as you achieve results, you're able to analyze, monitor, and see what's actually working or not working. The framework of choice, which is something that many organizations are using, is called SOSTAC. And SOSTAC is a fantastic strategy because the first thing you do is you need to look at your situation analysis, understand where you are today, look at your objectives and see where you want to go, look at the key steps of how you're going to achieve it, then think about the tactics, which are the specifics of your strategy, the actions that are going to then drive your tactics, but most importantly, again, controls in terms of monitoring and evaluation. And if you follow all these six steps through SOSTAC, 
The idea is that this then underpins any sort of digital transformation or innovation strategy that you're looking at developing for your business. When it comes to the area of content, what we know for a fact today is content in the forms of video, text, blogs, webinars, and so forth has become a key defining factor to how your brand or business is represented online to your various stakeholders. This means that many organizations, especially during and post pandemic, had invested in content creation capabilities in-house, facilities, technologies, and so forth. To the extent that in many organizations now, you'll actually find in-house studios. They're creating their own podcasts, shooting their own videos without necessarily using an external capability. And the reason for that is that if the content is coming from source and there's enough of a volume and high quality of content, that in itself becomes part of the innovation that you can bring in terms of your brand being seen and engaged in the right way. And why is this critical? The content in the digital context, it brings to life who you are and why you do what you do as a business organization. It helps you connect to your target audiences in a very personalized and authentic way. And it builds the relationships in a more relatable and contextually relevant manner. To put this more accurately, um, the first step here is really that brands, organizations are reaching a point that rather than owning or renting media, they become the media. That means that people are engaging and consuming your content just like we're doing today with the Springboard event. This webinar in itself is a form of media in the way that their brand is engaging with stakeholders. Number two, it becomes a key way of attracting and retaining customers via your digital channels. And ultimately what it does, it allows you to, as a brand, to create and create content to enhance or change consumer behavior around the products or services that you offer in the marketplace. And this for me is huge because if you can stop being the distraction as an organization or a brand and become the destination on digital platforms, then you can win the customer without having to be a sideshow by becoming the main show. We also see that when the content is effective, it's tightly focused on existing and intended audiences. It's content that's helpful, useful, and valuable. It can also be entertaining content, of which I'll show you some examples shortly, but also content that is woven within storytelling. Storytelling being one of the most powerful devices for cutting through the noise and connecting with relevant audiences. Again, when it comes to content and marketing, you want to make sure you develop value-added content, whether it's infographics, white papers, videos, podcasts, and so forth. Put it onto the relevant digital platforms, listen to what they're saying and engaging, and then going back into the cycle. With those insights, then you can create content that actually resonates with your stakeholders. But ultimately, there are two things that are really critical. Content and connections lead to conversations. And conversations ultimately lead to conversions within the digital context. If we break down this a little bit further, we need to understand, therefore, what kind of content actually works. Is it unexpected? Is it untimely? Is it provocative? Does it have movement and motion? Does it have a lot of color? Is it eye-catching? Is it thumb-stopping so that when you're scrolling, you actually stop to look at it? Are the visuals good or great? And then most importantly, are you creating and repurposing content that actually connects with your stakeholders. The cycle, as we like to say, is that you need to do the homework or the research to understand what content works. You then plan it out, especially when you have something like a content calendar to schedule it. You then create and curate that content. You publish, you measure that performance, and you strategize and go back into the process. If we look at the key considerations around what makes great digital content today, we can see that calendars are important in terms of when you plan them monthly to monthly to weekly basis what kind of content you publish, the content that you're going to create or share across your platforms, and also scheduling that content to be published when your audience is most active online. At the heart of it, the best content has an element of storytelling. So whether it's publishing on social media, whether it's being found on search engines or engaging community, you want to make it at the heart really about storytelling. So here are some examples, in my opinion, that represent great content. This was an instance on a Saturday morning and KCB decided to post this thing, which is a, basically a meme. And they're basically giving a shout out to CopBank and basically making fun of them. In response, we can see CopBank responds and they have a very fantastic clap back where again, they're using a meme uh, to say that they're looking for Maspono Attention Seekers Anonymous. So for me, this is an interesting instance where two of the largest indigenous banks are able to, on a weekend, have fun with each other and create engaging content where both their stakeholders actually rallied behind them in something that was entertaining. So for me, the illustration here is that the content doesn't have to be complicated. It can be fun, it can be entertaining, but most importantly, the stakeholders are plugging in and becoming a part of your brand. In this instance, this is a uh, Facebook group 
that I'm a part of, uh, that I've been on for many, many years. It's very, usually very tame. People are selling fridges, looking for places for children to play on the weekend and so forth. And then one day this young man shows up uh, shirtless and he's saying that he's a personal home trainer. And for some reason on that particular day, when this was posted, you can see that the engagement was ridiculous. Uh, over 350 comments, over 197 people had engaged. And basically this went almost viral on that particular day. And the point I'm trying to make here is that the content that cuts through the noise doesn't have to necessarily be controversial, but it's got to capture people's attention above and beyond the regular stuff they see. And there's even a lady there, as you can see, saying Jesus is Lord. So the point is, again, it's a bit humorous, it's a bit clever, but I think this young man is a genius because he was thinking to himself probably, how do I get attention in a space where things are generally quite quiet and I want the stakeholders to pay attention to me? And that's what he did. In this instance, this was during COVID. This is the Humans of New York. I'm sure many of you have heard of it before. In this case, um, I think they've used storytelling in a very powerful way. You can see the first post is the 9 of 12. And then you can see the second one there. Uh, they're putting a link that allows you to support them. And you can see the GoFundMe at the end. And the whole point here is that by the time you get to 9 of 12, the idea is that you've read uh, quite a bit of their story. This family lost everything after moving to the U.S. just before COVID. And during COVID, they lost everything. And uh, the Humans of New York, which usually shares people's stories, uh, shared this story. And then at the very end, they have the ask, which is if you feel you might want to support them, please do so. And as you can see that at that point in time, this family had raised close to 1.2 million through the GoFundMe as a result of Humans of New York. So again, as we think about how we communicate and we want to maybe acquire customers or even acquire support, uh, do we consider the fact that we have to tell a story or get people emotionally connected to the underlying story behind the challenge or the problem, which then in turn gets them connected uh, and more importantly, willing to contribute uh, or even purchase a product or service. In this instance, again, there's one of Humans of New York. This was a lady from South Africa uh, who was having financial challenges of going to flying school. Um, and basically, uh, in this instance, her story was very powerful and emotional. Her mother uh, was unable to pay for her to go. And Humans of New York actually were helping her to get some visibility and you can see there that this particular story was very powerful and emotional, and it had almost 437,000 engagements, 11,000 comments, and over 35,000 shares. Now, let me tell you, when it comes to social media, if people share your content, that is the highest compliment you can get, meaning that they want people in their network to see it. Equally so, you can see the other one from Chloride Exit from a few years ago. Uh, this was during, I believe, uh, Customer Service Week, but also Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And you can see that the senior management of Chloride X had all dressed as women on that day. Now, what's interesting about this story is that it wasn't just good entertainment. And you can see the engagement and the shares were also very significant, um, but they actually got more sales as a result of this content. So it's not just about entertainment. Sometimes content can also be entertaining and commercially uh, rewarding for the brand or the entity that creates that content. Uh, this was me uh, a couple of years ago, and I posted um, you know, this picture here. I was in traffic on Langata, and I saw this picture, uh, this billboard, and I was like, you know, I wonder if some men called and expected her to show up, and instead some random doothy guy came over. I had no expectations. I did this post in less than three or five minutes. And you can see that I got 71 retweets, over 152 likes, and uh, nine quote tweets. At the time, this was my most successful tweet. And it just goes to show you that content can perform really well, even if it's not particularly fancy, uh, just because it's something that resonates with your stakeholders. Now, what are the content performs really well in general? You want to make sure your content is highly visual. That means a lot of images, a lot of videos, and even emoji, because that's how people relate to content much these days. We also see from Cisco that when it comes to consumer internet today, over 85% of internet traffic is dedicated to video. So again, this is a very powerful statement or data point because it's telling us that the majority of consumers would rather watch a video than actually read your content, okay? So this is significant because it means then you've got to ask yourself in your digital innovation, are you creating enough video content? Remember, even a webinar like this is video. But just think about that very deeply and see whether you're actually doing the stuff that is going to get you the right engagement. We also see that content has to be platform specific, meaning that whether you're using Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, and so forth, are you putting the images in the right dimensions or the videos of the right length and so forth? Basically, each platform has its own unique uh, content uh, peculiarities, and you need to make sure that your content adheres or is aligned to those particular details. You also see that today, a lot of the content that people are consuming online is what we call short form, meaning that nobody's going to read on their phone long, 
elaborate content. So we say keep it simple or TLDR means too long, didn't read. So make sure that you also consider using uh, short form content. Another thing that has also changed in recent years is the amount of time it takes to get the attention. Basically saying, if your content does not make a connection with your target audience in three seconds, then it's unlikely your brand is going to connect with them. So very much in the very first instance, within three seconds, you need to make your content snackable. And these are trends that have been driven by the likes of TikTok, by the likes of Instagram Reels and so forth, where within a matter of seconds, you are sort of seen or understood what's being said, which then compels you to consume the rest of it. So three seconds is all we have. It used to be five seconds. Um, we also see the need for content calendars, something that allows you to schedule and plan your content on a weekly or monthly basis. This is really key if you're going to do your content in an effective way. To be more specific, in a content calendar scenario, you would have a diversity of types of content. So on Monday, you might have FAQs, Monday motivation, a Twitter poll, positive brand news. On Tuesdays, you'll do retweets, a key piece of content, ask a question, user-generated content. On Wednesday, you might do pro tips and so forth. But again, having a diversity of content and a scheduled a content calendar every day of the week allows you to have content that keeps your audience engaged and basically ensuring that it doesn't get boring for your stakeholders. You can also have what we call content themes so that on each day of the week, you have a unique type of content. So you might say Mondays for tips, Tuesdays for peeps, Wednesdays for free. Thursdays are normally popular with what they call throwback Thursdays. Fridays could be stories of maybe an employee or a customer. And then Saturdays and Sundays, generally, unless you're a restaurant or something of that nature, uh, we tend to be very informative and, and sort of relaxed content, what we call chilled content. Um, so again, keeping your content diverse and on brand is also critical. And again, just some examples of content that we've done in the past for our clients. This is for First Assurance, the Traffic Post. Um, and in this instance, we have another one for CPF when they're promoting their pension mobile app. Uh, and again, content can be diverse and interesting. You can have call to actions, links, hashtags, and so forth. And then when it comes to creating content, this is something that I find very powerful. The idea that you know even non you know designer people can create really great content. Canva has been in the market for probably at least five years. Even using the free version of Canva, uh, non um, graphic designers or people who are not professional graphic designers can work with templates and other things on this platform uh, to create great content. And even Canva allows you to create things like TikToks. Um, so for me, this is really exciting because. It just means that it democratizes creativity and allows even small businesses to create what I'd call professional grade uh, social media content, for instance. And again, you can do TikToks, Reels, and even YouTubes uh, coming through this platform. Um, other key considerations around content, it's about engagement. Uh, it has to be tailored for your audience. Focus on the what, who, and how your content will be used. And then also optimize your social media content across the different platforms so that it's the right dimensions the right durations to get uh, people connected to you. When it comes to social media, um, these are the platforms that matter the most. Uh, the one in yellow being Snapchat is one I'm still trying to figure out. I'm very proud to have learned how to use TikTok and I've even had a couple of TikToks go viral. Um, but ultimately, this is the space where we're playing in terms of the platforms of choice. Um, when it comes to Kenya, in terms of how these platforms are performing, uh, the one that is the largest is Facebook, sitting at actually about 13 million. Uh, YouTube is 6 million people having accounts, but around 15 to 20 million who actually use it to consume content. Uh, TikTok is the one that's been exploding over the last two years, you know, Instagram and Twitter and so forth. But ultimately, the number is sitting at about 25 million across all these platforms. And this means that there's a massive opportunity to reach almost 50% of the population of Kenya uh, through these various uh, social media platforms. But what is social media? It's conversations that are happening on these platforms. It's the platforms themselves where we publish our words, our pictures, our videos, and our audio. And it's the content that basically builds engagement uh, with our stakeholders on these platforms. And social media really has exploded in the last few years, especially during and beyond the pandemic for entertainment, information, conversations, and even e-commerce. There's many young people today, for instance, who are selling millions of shillings of product using Instagram. And TikTok in particular has become super popular with younger people, as well as conversations around social audio using platforms like Clubhouse and Twitter Spaces. And what is the typical workflow? If you're going to do social media effectively, you need to think about the two phases of acquisition and retention. You start off by listening to what people are saying on social media, whether it's about your brand or your competitors' brands, understand the tone, understand the issues, and only then do you use that insight to create content that's going to engage your stakeholders 
once they start engaging with your content, you then have the opportunity for them to actually become advocates for your brand. So going through the steps of listen, create, engage, and transform is how you can then have the most successful or effective uh, social media approach. I wanted to point this out very specifically, that one of the most powerful tools you can use for social media management is Meta Business Suite. This is 100% free. And if you have Facebook and um, um, Instagram pages, you can use it for free to manage and schedule your posts and make sure you get the most out of it. In addition to that, Meta Business Suite also allows you to connect to your WhatsApp account. So three different social media platforms can run off one dashboard. And again, it works on mobile and desktop, you know, common inbox, you can create ads, you can track insights, and insights are everything when it comes to managing your digital performance, see activities, and also access additional tools through the same. This again is an illustration of the professional version of Instagram. Not everyone uh, switches to the professional version for their Instagram accounts. This is again critical uh, because as you can see, it gives you things like the professional dashboard and additional features uh, that you don't get in the personal edition. So make sure that again, as a business, you are always on the professional version and then connect it to Meta Business Suite so that you can have one dashboard for connecting to your platforms. Um, I've shown Instagram Reels in particular, because again, this is something that uh, was started by Facebook to compete uh, directly or rather Meta to compete directly with TikTok. And these are the shorter videos uh, that today I think go up to 30 seconds or three minutes. Um, and more importantly, Instagram Reels is where there's a lot of attention today on the algorithm. So basically the point being that if you want to make sure you're getting engagement, focus on Instagram Reels today, focus on TikTok because that's where a lot of the younger consumers and increasingly even the more mainstream are consuming content. And in some cases, even using it as a replacement for Netflix. And also, of course, YouTube Shorts. When the biggest social media or digital platforms are competing, by extension, that means that this particular type of content is going to perform the best on that platform. So if you're on YouTube, that's great, but make sure you're creating more YouTube Shorts. If you're doing Instagram, make sure you're doing Reels. And of course, TikTok in itself already has so much mileage and traction, uh, you want to make sure you have a presence there. We also see the rise of social audio, where it's possible for you to create uh, content of an audio nature. Uh, in particular, we see Twitter Spaces being the most popular platform in Kenya today. A lot of conversations happening there, and many brands are using this uh, to engage the existing and prospective customers. We also see podcasts have become a very significant thing, as I showed you in, this, in the statistics. And many brands are now starting to create their own podcasts where they're having conversations around a diverse range of topics that are relevant to their stakeholders. To create a, a, a podcast is very simple, using something called Spotify for Podcasters. It's 100% free, and when you create it, it means that your podcast is available on Spotify, on Apple Podcasts, and also any other major podcasting platform. Another key area of importance today is influencer marketing, because again, they give us reach. They also create original content, and in many cases, consumer trust. This is an area of social media that we cannot ignore. And influencers really do matter, because as you can see here from some research, um, they have been known to generate as much as five times the return on investment for every dollar spent. So again, um, choosing the right influencer is critical. Um, going back to my love of Arsenal, you can see this was a moment when Danny Welbeck scored a magnificent goal. And when he went to the corner, he then did the sprinkling thing where he was copying Salt Bay. And it just shows you in the real world how people mimic or copy or follow what influencers do in the real world. And why does this matter? An organization is no longer what it tells the community it is. It is what the community tells each other it is. And to look at this dynamic in a more specific way where influencers are concerned, at the bottom, it's you talking about your organization. You engage influencers who start talking about your organization. At the end of it, others start talking about your organization. So the goal is to move from talking about it yourself and getting the whole world to speak about your organization, your brands, your products, and your services. When you're looking to work with influencers, there are four key steps that you need to follow. Number one, choose the right influencers, those who resonate with your target audience. This is not always the one who has 100,000 or a million followers. It could even be one that has as little as maybe 20 or 30 followers, but within that community, they have a great deal of influence who in turn can actually buy your product or service. Number two, the best influencers have become popular because of their storytelling narrative. People love what they say, how they produce their videos, the content they write, on and on and on. And the idea is that you want to tap into that storytelling to make you more successful. If you tell an influencer to do exactly what you want them to do, then it's unlikely that that is going to perform well. Um, you want to give them creative license, which means trusting them, knowing what they're doing. 
Uh, again, this is requires some level of understanding who you're working with, meaning that you need to also do the homework to make sure that um, this is the right fit for us and there's no history of doing dubious content. And lastly, partner with influencers who have a reputation or a good track record of doing content that works for other brands. This is an influencer platform where you can see uh, we're able to sift through the number of influencers available in Kenya, uh, specifically their combined reach. We can also see their ranking. Um, in this other slide, you can see their scoring. Some of them are five stars, some are two star. And this is kind of powerful because in some instances, one may not have as many followers, but you'll notice that they are five stars, meaning that whoever's used them for campaigns on that platform has rated them very highly. However, in other instances, you will see that they are not as popular or as successful as the others. Um, going a step further, one of the most popular influencer platforms today in the country is Wowzy. Wowzy is actually a Kenyan company that started providing a localized platform. They have a lot of depth in terms of the types of influencers they offer, including what you call nano influencers, people who have maybe a handful of followers, all the way to the ones who have millions. And the beauty about that is depending on your budget and your ability to invest, you can choose the right influencers for your brand, your business, your campaign on their platform with a very, very local flavor. Of course, you also have other international platforms like Clear, uh, which allows you then to also reach a more global platform uh, that can give you influencers in other markets above and beyond Kenya. We also see that social media analytics is incredibly important in terms of understanding the performance of social media. The majority of platforms have some sort of social media analytics built in. So again, you want to make sure that you're using this to kind of help you understand what's working, what's not working. And more importantly, that supports your data-driven decision-making to see how you can optimize and improve your social media performance. We now come to advertising. And again, advertising on digital platforms has become incredibly powerful. You can target based on data, behavior, we can look at where people are in terms of location, the content they're consuming, their professional profiles, uh, and so forth. And this is beautiful because what it allows you to do is really optimize your spend to get the best return on investment when you're using digital advertising platforms. So you can target, for instance, by the time of day. So if you know that your product is relevant in the mornings, that is maybe where you run your ads. So let's say you're a restaurant with a breakfast offer, then you'd only run your ads. Then you can target by geography, in many platforms like Facebook, we can even target down to as little as 100, uh, one kilometer radius from a place. Uh, you can target by the mobile network. So maybe your product or your proposition requires somebody to use M-Pesa. So you could say that we're going to leave it just on Safaricom. You could also target by the kind of content they're consuming online. Some would say women like shopping, men like football. So again, look at content as a driver of targeting. It could also be the kind of mobile device you're using, all right? So again, if I'm targeting a premium market, I can target by the kind of device somebody's using. If they're using an iPhone or a Samsung Fold, then I presume that's a premium segment. If they're using maybe a, a lower end a Techno and Phoenix phone, then that may be more appropriate for a different type of product. Again, these are just some of the ways in which you can target. Uh, Google Ads is by far one of the biggest digital advertising platforms allows us to put ourselves in front of the customer in different ways and at different times. Um, we also have Facebook ads, uh, which are very affordable, by the way, and allow us to reach customers at scale. Uh, we also see different ways of targeting, whether it's through awareness, consideration, or conversion, uh, meaning that we can optimize our campaigns on these platforms accordingly. We also see that we can run things like what we call Facebook lead ads, where the person on the other side gets to give us their phone number, email address, mobile number, and so forth. And this then allows us to have our sales team reach out to them. Uh, we also see that there's a capability built into these platforms called custom audiences, meaning that you can upload the contacts of your existing customers so that when they're on Facebook or Instagram, they only will see your ads because you know they're an actual customer. So maybe you're trying to upsell or cross-sell them a product. You know they're on those platforms. You can target them using their phone number, or their email address. You also have something called lookalike audiences. Again, this is something that you also find on other platforms like Google, where you have the ability to find audiences that are similar to your existing customers when you upload their phone numbers and email addresses. And this is very powerful because if you are trying to reach the right people with the right offer and they have a lot in common with some of your existing customers, then the likelihood of conversion improves significantly. Another way that you can improve your digital advertising is something called retargeting. And retargeting basically means that for instance, you see an ad and you don't actually uh, buy the product, then that means we retarget you for uh, more visual, uh, visibility of that particular ad. 
which hopefully will ultimately lead to a conversion. Only 2% of web traffic converts in the first visit. So there's 98% of opportunity that's unutilized. So think about what that means in terms of opportunity. And when it comes to your ads, make sure you test the different ad sizes and formats, uh, simplify conversions to make them very easy to engage, uh, capture leads and, and uh, track audiences for remarketing and re-engagement, and also try and make your campaign shareable. That if somebody sees something interesting, they can share it to their networks uh, via your platforms. Also, when running ads, make sure you test and uh, sort of improve your ads through uh, trying different creatives, different landing pages, um, and more importantly, using that data to optimize and ensure that you're getting the best performance possible. When it comes to measuring, uh, you want to make sure you're measuring things like reach, engagement, and effectiveness. Again, all of these KPIs or metrics are really important, and many of them will inform whether or not to continue. Uh, and most importantly, things like conversions or sales will tell you ultimately uh, whether your campaign or digital advertising is performing as expected. Lastly, we come to AI. I think this is an important space that we are all sort of getting exposed to. Uh, the onset of ChatGPT about a year ago really changed everything, although artificial intelligence has been around for some time. And what AI basically does, it takes a lot of data, analyzes that data for correlations, and this gives us patterns to make predictions about future states. So for instance, things like chatbots, um, you know, even that simple capability on Google Maps where if you're leaving from home and going somewhere and it predicts the amount of time it will take you, all of these things are underpinned by artificial intelligence. We also have something called machine learning, uh, which is a subset of AI uh, that allows us to improve the performance of AI systems uh, over time. So basically it's a self-learning capability that's built into AI. Uh, we have generative AI, which is what we're seeing now. So many of those platforms historically were what we call automated. Generative is where you put in an instruction, you put in a question, and it gives you a response and predicts what you're looking for, whether it's a text, graphics, or videos in a matter of seconds. And most of these are underpinned using something called large language models or LLMs uh, that have billions of parameters or even trillions that allow you to create this content through them. So naturally, there's OpenAI, who, as you know, for the last week had a lot of drama um, ChatGPT is their primary platform uh, that has really transformed a lot of what we know about what AI can do for us. You can see the kind of examples, capabilities, and limitations that you'd get um, through the platform here. Uh, we also have uh, something called uh, DAL E. DAL E is also an open AI product uh, that allows you to create images uh, that you can then use for also your digital transformation activities. Um, and here are some examples of the kind of images that you can create. Um, and then you also have other forms of using AI, such as chatbots, where you can have a different user interface, whether it's your website, your app, uh, you have different types of interpretation, you have your chatbot platforms, and then you can integrate those into your business systems. Um, you also have something called robotic process automation, uh, which allows you to easily build and deploy uh, managed software robots that emulate humans. And even in Kenya, we're seeing banks and insurance companies have done this uh, where these uh, robots are trained to do things that humans used to do, things like loan processing, for instance. So at an operational level, uh, it's almost like saying, uh, don't give a human a robot's job because there are things that robots can actually do better. And basically what we do is we have an entity that mimics human actions. We define what those processes are in terms of the steps. And then this is able to do these things without human intervention. Clear benefits, of course, it's more cost-effective, it's profitable, it's flexible, it's responsive. Uh, it removes mundane tasks from the day-to-day -day where uh, people are concerned. Um, and most importantly, there are different types of uh, robotic process automations. One of the most popular companies in this space is Zapier, uh, who allow you to aut automate a lot of business processes. Uh, we have another called UiPath uh, that also provides a robotic uh, process automation platform. And then Otter, maybe some of you have seen this, maybe you haven't. It's a fantastic tool uh, that allows you to take things like meeting notes, uh, allows you to transcribe uh, audio content into text, which again simplifies the time and effort required to do so. So what are the five things that matter the most? One, social media is key for your digital innovation because that's where the majority of internet consumption happens. Number two, mobile is everything because that is the primary interface or device that most people are using. Content is key for driving conversions and conversations online. Uh, video and visual content is what people are consuming the most. So don't fight that trend. Make sure you write it. And again, video can be webinars, can be TikToks, you know, all that is video. And of course, user experience, whether it's your website, your mobile app, make sure um, that your user experience is fantastic. 
And as always, we like to say that, you know, when it comes to content, um, even today, most people are using things like emojis. And that means you need to learn the dialect of the day, which is in this case, the emojis that you saw there were actually spelling out good morning. And lastly, I like quotes, and this is Wayne Gretzky, considered to be one of the best ever ice hockey players in the world. And people always wondered why was he able to score so many goals? And his answer was, I skate to where the puck is going to be, not where it has been. And the point here being that if you're going to be successful in digital transformation or digital innovation, um, don't necessarily look at where things are already, but start to think about where things are going in the future and some of the things that I've shared with you and start to understand and see how you can start to apply uh, the things that are going to be definitely part of the future so that rather than going to where they are, you predict where they're going to be and then you plan to be there when that trend or that new way of doing things becomes the norm. Thank you very much. At this point in wow. time, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Moses. That has been a very insightful session. I think we all become digital marketers in a span of one hour. We've got all the information we need to go online, start marketing our businesses. And some of before we go into the questions, I'll, I'll just highlight some of the take homes that I've seen that uh, how all of us spend like four hours on our phones and we can be able to target up to 25 million in Kenya right now who are always online. And something that you've also highlighted is the storytelling. And whenever we post things online, make sure we are having a story that is engaging, captivating, and content that is uh, engaging that will uh, drive people to your business. So also uh, we've seen how YouTube uh, shorts, Instagram reels, TikTok has been trending. And we've seen how influencers are actually utilizing those platforms to get people to uh, buy into uh, clients, products and such. So this has been a insightful session. So we have a lot of questions that are coming in the, the chat box. So let's start with number one. We have a question from Lucy. Um, he was asking, in what ways can business involve their employees in the process of digital information and how does it contribute to their overall success? I think digital innovation uh, or even transformation is not something that happens, you know, only on IT or only in the leadership side of things. I think it's across the organization. So that means when you're developing your digital transformation strategy, bring all the pillars into that process, whether it's people of HR, uh, people of procurement. Uh, people of marketing, people of uh, IT and so forth, so that it's a holistic process. So when you're looking at innovation, it's not just about, let's say, building e-commerce. It's not just about building one thing. It's about everything. And then when you're able to develop your strategy from that point of view, it's not only holistic and inclusive, but it also means that your stakeholders can also have that buy-in and the fact that this is going to have key benefits uh, for the organization. Wow, that's an insightful answer. I think we all... I uh, need to involve our people inside uh, our organization so that you can help us, the businesses grow. And we have another question about, uh, are there specific key performance indicators that businesses should focus on when evaluating the impact and digital innovation on sustainability? This is from Brand. Yes, I think there's several things that you need to consider. One is obviously when you think about your KPIs, you know, how are you actually achieving them? Um, so case in point would be if you're looking at, say, sales, you know, as a measure of uh, success, Maybe you are looking to double, triple, or quadruple your sales versus traditional channels. How are you doing that? But also when you think about the sustainability component, maybe when you're doing an e-commerce transaction, the cost and the operational elements of doing so might be significant cheaper than doing it in a more traditional way. And I think measuring the impact, measuring the outcomes, whether it's in terms of efficiencies, uh, whether it's in terms of sales, uh, whether it's also in terms of maybe allowing you to redeploy people to other operational functions that can be run by, let's say, a robot using robotic process automation, that in turn itself, you can have a measure of sustainability because you can then see how much you're saving, how much less you're using in terms of resources and how you're still allowing you to not just achieve but even exceed current performance, yet at the same time doing it in an efficient way. Interesting. Uh, so let's use the minimum resources to try and reach out to a lot of people as as much as we can so that we can have a better ROI on our digital uh, targets and measurements tools that we have. So the other question we've had is from Jacqueline asking about what organization changes are typically required for the technology innovation to move from a supportive function to a strategic pillar? That's a very interesting question. It's so interesting, but I'm, I'm actually in Diani uh, at the CIO conference. This has been a big part of our debates during this conference. 
And uh, what you will find is that the biggest conversation here is that technology needs to move away from being seen as a IT thing to being a C-level thing. So that means at the exco level, you need to make sure that the people leading the technology function in the organization are in that room when those strategic plans and decisions are being made. Number two, technology is not um, a cost center. It can actually be even a profit center, but also technology is a cross-cutting thing. It can help procurement. It can help sales. It can help HR across the board. So making sure that this is a C-level conversation and is being discussed at the onset of strategy and planning as opposed to the tail end as a cost center is something that needs to happen. And unfortunately, till today, we are finding that there's a lot of gaps between the leadership and also how they perceive the IT function versus looking at it as actually central to everything that sits within the overall strategy of the organization. So at that point, we're moving away from saying digital or transformation strategy. We're looking at actually the business strategy itself with technology embedded at the core. So you've had marketers and business owners, please engage uh, uh, your decision makers to have the technology or uh, people who are making decisions about technology in the boardrooms, as you say. Uh, then we will talk, have people talking about how it's insightful content. We have Zulu Wang also talking about what are common challenges business sales face when they're trying to get employees on board with digital innovations and how can effective change management strategies address these challenges? So this again is a conversation we've been having here in Diani. And the issue is that you can deploy all the latest and greatest tools, but people may not actually want to use them. And I remember talking to a CIO manager yesterday where they said that they actually withdrew the paper uh, driven processes and they had no option in that organization but use the digital workflow. Otherwise, it was not going to be adopted because the habit in that organization was very much a paper driven process. So in terms to get people on board, like I mentioned earlier, they need to be part of the creation or the formulation of these new digital innovations or transformations. And number two, to onboard the teams, meaning that you basically have to make the previous process subordinate or eliminate it completely and say that the only way that this happened is if it happened on the system. And that's how things like ERPs, CRMs, and even to some extent, even customer facing tools today work. If you think about how we all adopted eCitizen, we didn't have a choice. You cannot get your driver's license unless you go through that. So I think it's got to be almost that thing of either it's this way or there's no way. All right. Like we used to have a system in sales in another organization. And we said, if you did not report it on Salesforce, then the sale did not happen. All right. So it needs to be one of those mission critical things where it didn't exist or didn't happen unless it's on the platform. But most importantly, at the onset or inception of this process, make sure the team is part of it. Do not impose on them. Make sure that they're part of the creation and formulation so that there's full ownership when they're adopting the platform. Wow, interesting. As you've had it, you, it's always sure that everything that you do, you're having them on the system of the CRM and also invite all the team members to contribute into decision making when it comes to digital. I think we have a lot of questions about how this presentation uh, can be accessed. You can see a link down there, which is goes to our broadcast. So click on that link, it will take you to the broadcast. Hope Moses, you're okay with us sharing this presentation? Yes, absolutely, 100%, no problem. So lastly, before we finish, uh, is digital marketing cost effective with regard to software used in developing content? So is digital marketing cost effective in regard to the software used? Oh, yes, very much so. And like I was mentioning earlier, you know, you have tools like Canva, you have tools like um, the artificial intelligence tools for creating content like Dal E and ChatGPT itself, which many, many organizations now use for even creating content calendars. Um, so again, in terms of the software used to develop the content, it's absolutely cost effective. In many instances, many of these platforms at the most basic level are actually free. So what you need to do is get onto them, but more importantly, the tool in itself is not enough. What you ask it to do or what you are telling it to do, you must do in a good way. And that's why we call it uh, prompting. The prompting on platforms like ChatGPT and DAL-E is as important as the content you're going to get. So learning how to use them proficiently, and there are a lot of resources on Google to show you how to do that, is even more important than the tool itself. Because if you, it's almost like what we like to say in technology, garbage in, garbage out. Right? So if you put in a good approach and you do it in the best practice, then you will get the best outcome from that process. Interesting. And lastly, before we end, uh, how can you ensure data privacy and security while still fostering innovation and growth? I think data privacy has become a trend that uh, has been uh, going, going in Kenya, so you can help us answer that. Yeah, actually, we're very fortunate in Kenya that we have a robust uh, set of laws under the Data Privacy Act. 
and we have an entity that deals with uh, data or digital privacy, which is the Office of the Data Protection Commissioner. My recommendation today, no matter what size of business you are, make sure you register either as a data controller or a data processor with the Office of the Data Protection Commissioner. That's step number one. Why? Because it allows you to make sure that you're licensed if you're handling customer data or you're handling data on behalf of third parties that you first of all have the mandate to do so. Number two, you also have to provide your data privacy policies, okay, to the ODPC that clearly outline how you have developed those policies and how they are aligned to the law that is in place. The beautiful thing is that to register as a data processor or a data uh, controller is actually not expensive. I think it's 5,000 shillings in each instance. But you can see the consequences. The school that was, I think, fined two months ago, 4 million shillings, for using pictures of students uh, within the school without their consent. So this is real, this is a risk. But I'll say the first step is make sure you're compliant, get registered with ODBC, and also make sure you have documented and clearly defined uh, data privacy policies within the organization that your entire workforce is aware of so they know where and when not, not to have data. So even for instance, in some events I've attended recently, before even you, you enter the, the room, uh, the, you have to sign a consent form to confirm that you're okay with your data and your photos being used. Or before you enter the room, you have to fill an online form and show consent that if your pictures or any of that information is used in the public space, that you're okay with it, all right? So make sure that you are adhering to or compliant with what the current laws and, and best practices are. Very excellent, slow. Um, I'm, I'm sure you've also been in different uh, events where you've been asked, can you take a photo? You've been given a response if you're okay, another response if you're not. So let's take uh, data privacy seriously and also start off the registration in the data office. So um, I'd like Moses, you give us a brief in the, uh, description about who Dot Survey is yourself and how we can reach out to you for any of your services. Oh, thank you so much for that. So Dot Survey is a a uh, digital business agency. We started the company uh, back in the year 2002. So we've been around now for 21 years. Uh, at the very early days, we were primarily focused on building and managing websites for our clients. Uh, in later years, we also started doing social media and content uh, across the board for our clients. And in that time, we've also expanded the scope of our services uh, to do more digital products, everything from video to animations, uh, to building things like mobile apps, uh, to doing even some of these robotic process automations, lead management, digital advertising, and so forth. And the main thing that we pride ourselves on is we call it high-performance digital marketing, meaning that we are not just creating content and being present online. We always want to ensure that from a data-driven perspective, our clients can see an ROI. An ROI is not always just about sales. It can be things like your brand sentiment. It can be growing your profiles can be maybe how you engage your clients on customer experience and so forth. But we always want to ensure that across our digital propositions uh, that our clients see a significant impact to the bottom line, but also other softer targets and KPIs that ultimately make sure that their business performs well in the digital space. Thank you so much. I think now you can see the screen being projected on how you can reach out to Moses. And uh, we'll come to the end of this webinar. So I'll talk a brief, briefly about Springboard Capital and who we are. Springboard Capital is a microfinance and we've been there for the last 10 over years and we've been transforming lives and offering financial services to individuals, businesses for the for those past decade. And if you need money, we are here to serve your needs. Go to our website, go to our social media platforms, go to the near town near you, there's a branch and a satellite there. Reach out to us on any of your preferred social media channels. So thank you so much everyone for tuning in and we hope you've gone into the broadcast and put in your name so that we can reach out to you and share the presentation with, with you. Uh, thank you so much. See you next month on the last Friday of the month. Goodbye.